Okay, welcome everyone. For those of you who don't know me, if there's anyone that joined uh, who doesn't know me, my name is Julie Moretta. I'm a grad student in the Material Science PhD here at Montana Tech. And um, last summer, uh, last June, I attended the National School on Neutron and X-ray Scattering. Um, and I, one thing I learned at this school was that Montana is severely underrepresented both at the school and as a user at some of these, um, what are called user facilities across the nation. And so I decided that I wanted to um, try to change that by sharing some more information about the school, making it more well known among the Montana research community, um, and then also sharing some uh, other basics about user facilities and scattering. Joining me today is Dr. Bev Hartline. She is our Vice Chancellor for Research here at Montana Tech. Um, she's also our Dean of Graduate Studies. And Dr. Hartline is a former project director um, for the, I believe it was the Spallation Neutron uh, LINAC at Los Alamos. She was also, she's also a former Deputy Lab Director at um, the Advanced Photon Source at Argonne National Lab. So Bev is really much more of an expert on all things scattering and um, tech related if it has to do with scattering. So she has very graciously um, consented to answer questions as we go along here. So for those of you joining remotely, if you have questions, you can go ahead and ask them in the chat window. And Dr. Hartline is gonna monitor that chat. Um, and she is going to try uh, her best to answer your questions as they come up. For those of you in person here today, <laughs> you, can, um, you can either ask questions as I'm going along or you can wait till the end and ask them um, later on. All right, so today I have three primary topics. I really wanna talk about the National School on Neutron and X-ray Scattering. Um, this is called NXS School for short, so I'm gonna to refer to it as that, um, and how to apply for this school. And there's um, some great information available on the Oak Ridge and Argonne National Lab websites um, about the school, as well as the actual application itself. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the um, methods that we use to measure scattering because we know that we can observe these phenomena but how do we quantify them and measure them. I'm going to keep this topic very very basic um, in order to sort of lay the groundwork for the upcoming lectures um, which will be uh, much more detailed and um, discussing experiments at a higher level than I can actually talk about them. So um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the neutron and x-ray um, facilities they call it the x-ray facilities um, at in this case, the Advanced Photon Source um, at ANL. So the National School on uh, X-ray, uh, Neutron and X-ray Scattering um, has a primary mission of educating students about these techniques and about the facilities um, where you can do the, uh, some of these experiments. So as it's been running, I believe this upcoming year is the 23rd year that they've run this school. So they've been doing it for a long time. Um, the people that you're going to hear from at the school and the people that you're going to interact with really are the experts in um, that particular scattering technique um, uh, with certain types of materials uh, at certain facilities. They're really specialists and in a lot of cases they're the people who actually designed the experimental um, hardware and um, in some cases the technique itself. So there's nobody better to learn from. Um, they really introduce a lot of the scattering principles and techniques in much more detail. Um, so I don't want to scare anyone off, but um, some of these are a little bit complicated. And so they really walk you through from the very basics of scattering to some of the more complex analyses um, that you can do with these um, uh, probes. So then you get to interact, if you get to go in person, um, you get to interact with the scientists, go into the beam lines, actually conduct some mock experiments, um, watch them conduct experiments. And I was really looking forward to that experience, but because of COVID was unable to, um, to get that uh, opportunity. So um, again, I attended remotely, but it was, it was still really worthwhile. I believe in this um, next 23rd um, NXS school, they are going to have it be purely remote again. That's what the plan is. Um, so I think they I think it's going to span three weeks this year with one week being um, half day where you get to 
to participate in some remote experiments. So it'd be a little bit of an upgrade from what I got to do last year in terms of the experimental um, experience, but not quite the same as going on site. Um, that being said, I would still encourage anyone who's interested to attend. You're going to learn just a ton and get to interact with really, really cool people. So the school's put on by scientists from three different user facilities. So the Advanced Photon Source, APS, and Argon, where they do x-ray scattering, and then two neutron sources, both at Oak Ridge National Lab um, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. So the Spallation Neutron Source, SNS, and um, the HIFER, the High Flux Isotope Reactor. All right, I have this awesome video that I got from the Oak Ridge um, website. It really gives you sort of a, a picture of what the experience is like in going to um, school if you get to, to actually go onto the campuses of these user facilities. And please, Bev, if you could give me a thumbs up if you can hear this when I start it. Okay, not hearing it. Um, I don't really know what to do here. Um, Just turn closed caption. Turn closed caption. Subtitles. What if we try that? Is that okay? I guess it's better than nothing. Um, you can still look at the pictures. They're pretty awesome. Okay, um, can you hear me still again now? Beth? Okay, thumbs up. All right, I'll continue then. All right, so the deadline for this um, next uh, NXS school is coming up pretty quickly. And so if you are interested in applying for the um, 2021 NXS school, um, I urge you strongly to, to start right away. So go to um, both, visit both of these websites. Um, I, I find that the ORNL website is actually a little easier to navigate. I don't know why, maybe just my preference. Um, the ANL website also has links to um, information about the school and the application itself. So, you can, so it doesn't matter which one you go to, you still get to the same place. Um, the application process, first and foremost, I think you should discuss it with your advisor. Talk about your topic of interest, why you would want to use the, uh, one of these tools or both of these tools optimally. And um, then go ahead and go online and begin your application. You do have to register as a uh, user at, um, I believe, just the ANL website, but possibly both. I can't remember, honestly, so sorry about that. Um, Bev may know, so uh, if, if you can ask her on the chat, do that. Um, and then you'll need to write a statement describing how you will use neutrons or x-rays in your research. So that's, um, again, coming from your conversation with your advisor. Um, you want to make this sort of a really compelling argument because this is a very competitive process. Only 60 students get selected annually to attend this school. Um, although students from underrepresented states like Montana are um, quote unquote highly encouraged to apply, um, that's not a guarantee that you're going to get in though. So um, you need three letters of recommendation, uh, one of those being from your advisor. 
um, notify those folks as soon as you can, as soon as you um, choose who you want to have write a letter for you. So they have plenty of time to work on it and get it submitted. They submit it through an, through email rather than submitting it um, through the application website. Um, but those instructions are all uh, part of um, the uh, application materials. So students using physical analysis techniques, um, let me back up, graduate students using phys physical and um, analytical techniques in their research are eligible for this school um, and those students living in North America. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen to attend um, as far as I understand but there may be some paperwork limitations if you are not a U.S. citizen so look into that right away if you do want to attend um, this year's school. All right, so now I'm gonna move on to the second part of my talk um, where I'm gonna just discuss scattering in a little bit um, more detail in a way that helps you understand how we can actually measure and quantify scattering. So we know that um, waves, you know, um, light and sound uh, can be scattered by objects having the same size scale and energy scale. Um, so we know that um, if we are in a long hallway, we can hear scattering. We can hear a loud sound around a corner because sound waves are scattered um, by that corner. Uh, we know that the blue color in the sky is due to um, scattering of UV light by uh, molecules in our atmosphere. Scattering quantitatively involves a change in direction or a change in energy of the incident um, wave. So it can also, um, uh, constitute both of those things so we can have a change in direction accompanied by um, a change in energy. All right, so the electromagnetic spectrum is what we're really going to be talking about today. So we know that it spans just a tremendous range of wavelengths and um, energies. And X-rays and neutrons really fall in this. So if you look at the scale that's on the right, or wavelength, this is in meters. Um, uh, we're used to maybe seeing it in nanometers or, or angstroms or something, so keep that in mind. Um, but so neutrons and x-rays really fall sort of in this um, shorter wavelength, much higher energy end of the spectrum. And that allows us to look at things on the angstrom scale. Um, so for instance, um, the nuclei of atoms, at, um, the position of different atoms and molecules, um, protein structures, and things like that. All right, so these probes also have some unique characteristics and unique properties that allow them to interact with matter in different ways. And that's how these can be um, complementary to each other. So neutrons um, have no charge. They do have um, a magnetic spin. So neutrons interact only with the nuclei of atoms. They are not scattered by electrons, which are charged particles. Um, they can interact with nuclei in two ways through nuclear scattering, where they interact with the very short range nuclear forces um, of the um, atoms. And then they can interact um, uh, also with the uh, magnetic dipoles of unpaired electron spins. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about this type of scattering today, but there, if, if you are looking at doing research or you're currently doing research that involves you know, magnetic um, data storage type materials or something like that. There's an awesome, awesome talk um, that they do at NXS School on um, magnetic scattering. Okay, so getting back to um, nuclear scattering. So the nuclei of atoms appear almost as point uh, scatterers to neutrons because of these short range nuclear forces. And so what neutrons see is really just a lot of empty space in, in materials. Um, whether they're amorphous materials or crystalline materials, it doesn't matter. Um, they have a much deeper penetration depth for this reason. X-rays, on the other hand, are scattered by the electron cloud of um, at the atoms in materials. And so they scatter through uh, electromagnetic interactions and their penetration depth um, because of this scattering based on electrons is um, much shallower. Um, Anyone who's tried to do transmission electron microscopy knows that um, if we're using electrons as the probe, um, that penetration depth is, uh, becomes even, even less due to this uh, electrostatic scattering effect that, that electrons have with other electrons in the material. So 
anyone listening, um, I don't know who's listening or how many are listening, but if you've done x-ray diffraction or um, Raman spectroscopy, then you are using a scattering technique. Um, they may be elastic or inelastic or coherent or incoherent, um, but they're still scattering. And so, but those sources have much lower energy levels than um, neutrons or synchrotron x-rays. And that's really the um, benefit of these user facilities is we have access to these tremendously high energy um, uh, probes that we can use to look at much smaller time scales and much smaller length scales than we can with other techniques. Um, this little graph on the left, um, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but the neutron uh, methods are the blue line and X-ray uh, synchrotron X-ray methods here are the orange. So we see that they span just a really tremendous length scale, but they can access some of these much smaller length scales um, that other methods cannot. Similarly, we can access uh, these very, very short time scales in conjunction with very short length scales if we're using inelastic scattering techniques. So I talked a minute ago about this penetration depth. Um, another important factor um, in neutron scattering is that neutrons really don't have any sort of systematic uh, dependence in terms of their penetration depth on the atomic number of, of your species. They are very sensitive to light elements, in fact, can be um, more sensitive to light elements. Um, Strangely, there are a few materials that are, are very strong absorbers of neutrons, for instance, boron. And so these materials make really good shielding and um, detector materials. And in fact, that's what they use, um, as far as I know, at ORNL. X-rays, on the other hand, have a definite um, dependence on the atomic number because they're scattered by the electron cloud. So the more electrons an atom has, um, the more scattering events, but also um, the more destructive interference and, and um, the more readily they sort of the, sort of the intensity of these scattered waves um, drops off. Yeah, I have a question here, just a second. Uh, just in yellow. Um, what okay. Say? Oh, sorry. He was asking about the yellow curve. Yeah, so that is, um, that's electrons. electrons. So if you're using um, electrons as a probe, um, which I'm, I'm, I, that was just in this graph um, presented in his little book about um, neutron scattering, Roger Penn presented that. Um, so um, another thing about X-ray scattering is um, we see sort of this periodicity associated with our electron cloud, and that's um, what we would expect. All right, um, I think we're doing okay on time. So there are a couple of um, considerations in scattering. So you want to understand a little bit about whether your material is going to scatter coherently or incoherently. It can make a difference in how you conduct your experiment and process your data. Coherent waves are scattered waves from different nuclei which interfere with each other in phase. So the peaks of these waves add up rather than just random points along the waveform adding up. Incoherent scattering um, is a process in which the scattered waves from different nuclei do not have the same phase in a particular scattering direction. And then you've probably heard about elastic and inelastic scattering, um, maybe uh, in a class or, or doing some experiments. But what do we really mean by this? So in terms of um, neutrons or x-rays, an elastic scattering event is one in which the um, scattered wave vector it, uh, changes angle, but it doesn't really change the energy of that scattered wave. So it goes in, let's say, uh, some green wavelength. Um, it comes out at a green wavelength. We haven't ended up with um, maybe uh, a red wavelength or something, and then is scattered at some scattering vector two theta. For an inelastic scattering event, um, the incident wave loses energy and is also scattered at some angle two theta. All right, so there are some uh, really, in my mind, wonderful tools, um, mathematical tools that we have to use to be able to actually quantify a scattering event. Um, this really great image um, from uh, Dr. Rodriguez, Rodriguez at the University of Maryland. He was one of the speakers at um, NXS school, and um, he did a lot of the uh, discussion on sort of um, scattering basics and the math of scattering. And so what we see in this image on the left is an incident, um, let's say it's a neutron beam, um, incident beam coming in and scattering off the lattice planes of our sample, in this case an FCC crystal, it looks like to me, um, and 
those some of the, the um, beam is scattered at some angle. Um, in order to represent this mathematically, we have to change into um, reciprocal space. This is sometimes also called K space or momentum space. Um, and I'm not going to elaborate on a whole lot on what that is. Um, I think later on in a lot of your classes, you'll learn more, more about this if you haven't learned it already. Um, basically, real space having units of length and time, reciprocal space is just what it sounds like. We have units of inverse length and inverse time, um, and that's a way of quantifying momentum that's been transferred during a scattering event. It's important to note here that um, the scattering plane itself is perpendicular to the lattice planes um, in the FCC structure, and also that the scattering angle, um, which we're going to continue to call 2 theta, occurs in that scattering plane. If we have scattering in 3D, then we, we can rotate this angle 2 theta um, through 2 pi radians um, in a, basically a, a sphere, and, and then sort of add up all of the scattering um, throughout that sphere. But getting back to sort of what is, what is reciprocal space and how we use it. Um, so we know that we can go ahead and represent waves, um, in this case a sine wave, uh, using this exponential form because of uh, Euler's formula, right? We take the imaginary part of Euler's formula, um, at, and so this would be um, this k vector is our um, what we call the wave vector. It's basically the trajectory of our incident and scattered wave, if that makes sense. And then it's dotted with this position vector r. So this is the position vector in real space, which sort of gives us um, our, our trajectory of the wave's momentum in real space. Um, and then this uh, phi here we know is our, our phase. So if we have um, two different waves scattered having two different phases, we can still go ahead and um, change the notation maybe just slightly, but we can still add them up together, right? Um, A here, uh, is, is the amplitude of that wave at the peak. Okay, so what happens if we have an incident wave having wave vector k sub i for incident, um, and it's scattered in our material here in real space. It scatters at some angle to theta, and then our um, scattered wave has wave vector um, k sub f, and um, we see in this case our wave, we, we come in with a green wavelength, we go out with a green wavelength. So this is an elastic scattering event that makes the math a whole lot easier. And that's really all I'm going to talk about today because of the um, time. If you're interested in inelastic scattering though, by all means, um, go to the uh, ORNL or ANL websites and there's a lot of supplementary information. I'll also have some information at the end. Um, okay, so, so K really, what it does is it allows us to transition between um, momentum space and real space through this relation here, where the magnitude of k is equal to 2 pi over lambda, which is the wavelength um, of interest. So we quantify any transfer of momentum, including um, this change in angle, right, um, by taking the incident wave vector and subtracting the final wave vector. That's just a convention. You can do kf minus ki, and you get the same final um, wave vector as we know from um, vector calculus. So that's, this is what that looks like in reciprocal space on the right hand side. Um, Ki going in, Kf, we flip flop it because we're taking um, the negative value and then we end up with our um, what's called the momentum transfer, Q. Q is, is the important quantity in scattering. Um, all of the mathematics of scattering um, revolve around calculating Q at every possible scattering angle um, at every possible energy level. And you can imagine um, that when we're talking about maybe even maybe small scattering angles, but also large scattering angles, you're going to end up with just a tremendous amount of data points. And so really, that's what this summation here um, is all about. So this is our scattered wave vector um, for two points in real space, J and K, because this the way this equation works is in a pairwise fashion. And then um, we calculate sort of how strong of a scatterer um, uh, each atom in our material is um, in the geometry at those energies. Um, that's what our form factor is. And we also have to accommodate thermal motions, um, quantum mechanical considerations, and things like that 
Um, so these um, scattering equations really end up getting fairly complicated. And um, in the upcoming lectures, I know um, one of the lecturers uh, in particular plans on talking about this, the math of scattering and how you extract useful information um, from, from your uh, scattering data. And so I'm just gonna leave this one right here. But I do want you to note, um, we, we have to base our experiment on something that we can measure, right? As with any experiment. And so the thing that we're really measuring here is photons. We're measuring the photons coming in to the detector, which is at some particular scattering angle, um, and then over the over time and over all energies, if that makes sense. Um, and we quantify that as intensity, um, so I of Q. This is also called S of Q um, and called the structure factor. So don't be confused, I, and Q, I of Q and S of Q um, are pretty much the same thing. Uh, for inelastic scattering, we have to add our time component, so we have S of Q and omega. Um, and my little teaser here. So join us for the next lectures to learn more um, about how to use S of Q or S of Q omega. Neutrons and x-rays are used across just this tremendous um, range of diverse fields. We can do um, biomechanics, we can do energy technologies and look at ion transport. Um, we can look at um, uh, crystalline structures of uh, proteins and of, of um, engineering materials and ceramics, and um, we can look at even crack growth in real time. So um, I really like this experiment done in the middle here. So they used X-ray microtomography, which is an imaging technique to be able to watch crack propagation uh, through stainless steel in real time. Um, and then obviously a lot of the resources at uh, all of these user facilities are being devoted to COVID research right now. There are um, some just recently published in which they were looking at um, molecular motions of some COVID-19 treatment drugs. All right, um, so now I'm gonna move to the final segment of my talk. I hope I've um, brought up a lot of questions that you all might have moving forward about um, the techniques and about scattering and how we measure it and how we use it because um, I want you to want to come to the next talks and want to apply to NXS school. Um, but now this is just a little more basic stuff about the facilities. So at Oak Ridge National Lab, there are actually two different neutron generating facilities. This one is called the Spallation Neutron Source. Um, uh, we call it SNS for short. Um, so a spallation source is different from a radio, uh, a reactor source in that it generates very intense pulses of neutrons. There are five primary components to the SNS at Oak Ridge, starting way back here in the back. If you can see my mouse um, or look at the number one in the building right next to it, if you can't see my mouse, um, there's this sort of long building. This is where hydrogen ions are generated. So it's hydrogen atom with an extra electron. Um, and then they send these hydrogen atoms down this um, long skinny tunnel um, that is basically a tube of very specially designed magnets which accelerate those um, negative hydrogen ions to really increase their energy. And then they hit um, sort of this carbon foil that's designed to strip away those extra electrons, leaving us with only a proton. So then this proton enters what's called the accumulator ring and these protons um, just spin around in this accumulator ring uh, a large number of times. I can't remember how many times, it's a lot. Um, and, and it's timed such that the protons accumulate in bunches, right? Um, so they're not evenly spaced throughout this ring. And then after a certain number of turns around this accumulator ring, they kick them out and they hit the actual um, spallation target is what it's called. So in this case at, at SNS, we have a liquid mercury target. So what happens is each of these protons smashes into a mercury nucleus, um, releasing a whole lot of energy and releasing, I think, 20 to 30 neutrons um, with each collision. So it's really like sort of a, um, a neutron amplifier, so to speak. And um, the liquid is also important because a lot of the excess energy that's generated has to be removed as heat and um, having a liquid target makes that easier. Then the final stage is this um, sort of large building in the middle um, by number five. That's where our beamline instruments, detectors, where all the science is done. 
So I had this really cool video, but I just, I don't know if it's worth watching. Um, if you, I guess I'll leave it to um, sort of maybe, yeah, I, I think I'm going to skip it. It's a really cool video that shows um, how the SNS works. It has great animations. You guys can go on to the ORNL website if you want to watch it and um, uh, just dig around and you'll find it um, if you, uh, I think, just Google um, Spallation Neutron Source and ORNL YouTube videos. You might even bring it up. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a, a really great animation showing how all of this happens. Okay, so I talked about SNS being a pulsed source. So why? <laughs> um, why is that important, this huge expensive facility? Um, okay, so what a, what a pulsed source gives us really is this extremely high um, peak intensity of neutrons compared to a radiation source a reactor source um, which generates a continuous neutron flux at a much lower intensity. Both of these are extremely useful. It's just that this um, very high intensity pulse allows us to do um, slightly different kinds of experiments than we can do with this um, lower neutron flux beam. So the peak neutron production at SNS um, being about 10 times that of HIFER. However, um, the time averaged neutron production at HIFER is um, quite, actually quite a bit higher than at SNS. The neutrons that come out of the spallation source are um, really, just really, really energetic. They're in fact too energetic to actually use right out of the, right out of the gate. Um, so they, they have to do something called moderate these neutrons to make them useful. We know that neutrons are only going to interact with things that have similar energies. Um, and in fact, this helps us design experiments because we have to be able to um, measure the energy changes. And if, if your energy change compared to your overall neutron energy is very, very small, then you may not be able to detect that event um, that just happened. So they use um, liquid water, they use uh, liquid hydrogen, I believe, for moderators. And these act like energy sinks. The um, neutrons go in there, they collide, they lose energy, and they are scattered and come out the other end uh, at much lower temperatures, uh, having much slower velocities and at much lower energies and longer wavelengths. Oh, I'll go back real quick. Um, so yeah, so this is a huge range of wavelengths. And so that's really one of the benefits of this source too, is we can just do um, research over a tremendous uh, range of size and length scales that um, I don't believe uh, are available at every other um, neutron source. All right, so the high flux isotope reactor is just what it sounds like. It's, an, it's a fission reactor source. So neutrons are generated through fission of uranium-235, and it produces a very, very high flux of neutrons um, and also a whole lot of other radi uh, um, re reactor type products, radiation products. Uh, it was originally designed to produce um, nuclear materials, and then later on they started doing neutron science with it. So it's it's older than than the SNS. It consists of two components. This taller building, number one here, that's the actual reactor core itself, and then the guide hall. So there are um, four tubes um, oriented tangentially to this uh, reactor core, and so those four tubes. Uh, point out towards um, this guide hall and direct the neutrons toward 13 different instruments in this um, uh, facility. I had another awesome video um, about HIFER. I'm not going to show it either, but I really want to encourage everyone to go ahead and, um, and Google this too. It's really cool. It shows pictures of the reactor core, people working in there, people using the instruments. There's some great visuals of what detectors look like and, and um, sort of experimental uh, hardware looks like. So, so check that out when we're done. All right, and then the final facility I'm going to talk about today um, is what's known as a synchrotron radiation source. So a synchrotron generates um, x-rays by accelerating electrons uh, radially in this case, and it it's a pretty complicated, just tremendously huge facility. You can see um, the cars sitting around next to it, and that gives you a sense for how big this ring is. So synchrotrons are generated um, in three different, uh, basically three different steps. 
this long skinny building in the middle, this is this houses the electron gun and a linear accelerator to boost those electrons up to the um, MeV range. Then they enter what's called a um, booster ring, which I can't, I, I, I think this is a hill and it's underneath here. Um, if, you have, if you're not sure, maybe somebody can ask Bev on the chat. Um, <clears throat> and so that booster ring, uh, it, its job is to then kick those electrons up to um, the giga electron volt range in terms of energy. And then that is really the, the useful range of synchrotron um, related uh, electrons. So once they hit that seven GeV range and they're bunched up into a big enough bunch, um, they kick them out into this storage ring where they continue to um, make circuits around this storage ring. Uh, I think they, um, Dennis Mills, who's um, one of the directors at APS, um, I believe he said that they can get away with only making electrons twice a day um, and that they, there's enough energy created in that process to be able to use um, those uh, x-rays for experiments um, you know, throughout the day. Maybe it depends on what experiments they're doing, uh, but I was really surprised by that. I thought it was sort of a continuous process. Okay, and then um, the final feature is are these little um, triangular things sticking out, look like little sunshine rays sticking out from the synchrotron. Um, those are actually the instrument hutches. That's where people set up their experiments and, and do their science. So this, the um, storage ring is, is really not round. Um, it's actually a bunch of straight sections connected by bending magnets. So electrons can be deflected in their path by a strong magnetic field. And they do that at APS using a dipole bending magnet shown here is these big long red things. They're about two meters long, uh, three meters long, I'm sorry, about two meters high, I believe. Um, and then, so that steers the electrons around the device and then they use um, different types of magnets, sextipole and di uh, quadrupole magnets, the yellow and blue devices shown here, um, to focus that electron beam and keep it, um, keep it narrowed down so that it doesn't expand and um, splatter into the sides of the, the high vacuum tubing that it's flying through. Um, okay, so then the final component are, are things called insertion devices. And this is really where um, the x-rays are generated, the useful, very high energy, highly coherent x-rays that um, are really important for research being done at APS. <clears throat> all right, so this is a photo of a section of the large storage ring and it shows all of the devices. Just to show you really how large this thing is, there's a technician standing down here um, at the far end and you can see that the, this um, big red bending magnet is actually taller than she is. Um, you can also see that everything is mounted on this girder system. <clears throat> so if you're interested in an engineering challenge, I think maybe you should go work here. I think this is really cool. Um, this girder system has tolerances of under 100 microns, if you can imagine that, keeping this much equipment precisely around, aligned <laughs> to within 100 microns. Um, additionally, um, this system is very sensitive to, um, to seismic activity. So this is just a constant battle, keeping everything aligned how it needs to be to actually keep the equipment functioning properly. Um, this black thing down here on the far end is an insertion device. The red things are the bending magnets. You can see they're not very far apart. Um, so they probably don't deflect the electrons spatially you know, very much, but um, anyway. All right, so insertion devices. So. The most important one at APS is called an undulator. And an undulator is used to um, generate x-rays, but in a way that causes the x-rays to add up in phase. So you're adding their peak intensities together. Um, and then uh, it, that also increases the coherence of the emitted x-ray beam. This is done by um, align, uh, setting up this long series of aligned magnetic fields. So they're alternating magnetic fields separated by um, permanent magnets in the middle. And um, you can tune that magnetic field by separating the top set of magnets from the bottom set of magnets um, and tuning the spacing. And so that really fine tunes your emitted X-ray wavelength. Um, so different undulators can be used, I think, in different positions depending on what uh, type of x-rays you want to use. 
So the other devices, um, I talked a little bit about bending magnets and they were not originally designed to be used um, as an X-ray source, although because they deflect the path of the electrons, they actually do emit X-rays. Um, so <laughs> some of the folks at EPS called these free X-rays <laughs> because you need the, um, these devices in the instrument anyway. Um, they, the the X-rays emitted from bending magnets have a much wider spectrum of wavelengths, right? And and they're not quite as bright as um, what we get from from the undulators. And then Wigglers, um, Bev may correct me on this, but I don't think there are any Wiggler devices at APS. Um, but the the purpose of a Wiggler is very similar to the purpose of an undulator in that it's designed to generate um, intense X-rays, but it does this in a little bit different way. So similarly, it's a series of these strong magnets, right? Um, but they deflect very strongly. And so uh, a lot of X-rays are emitted at, at each one of these um, bends, but the wiggles add up um, with, uh, with the number of wiggles rather than um, in the way that the undulator adds up. Okay, so I'm getting close to my time point here. So I think I have time to talk about a few more things. Um, all right, this I really like this plot here that compares the um, photon energy, or if you will, the wavelength of available X-ray sources with their, their brightness. So um, if you do X-ray diffraction down in camp or at MSU up in ICAL or something like that, you're using copper K alpha radiation. Um, <clears throat> copper K alpha, Radiation um, has fairly high energy, but, but it's a very um, monochromatic uh, energy and fairly low brightness, right? And so when we want to talk about the, the difference in brightness between a bending magnet, um, say uh, x-rays produced from a bending magnet and those in a, in a lab type x-ray source, we see there's like three or four orders of magnitude difference there. Um, and that allows us to do uh, a whole wider range of different scattering experiments um, and probe materials um, much more deeply than we can with um, like a powder diffraction type experiment. It also, a bending magnet radiation also spans a much um, wider range of wavelengths. Remember I said it, that really broad spectrum radiation. And then um, <clears throat> you can see up here at the top, this is the APS um, uh, undulator type radiation. And there's, really a, a two or three order of magnitude increase by using undulators as opposed to just using x-rays produced by a bending magnet. Um, so that's what really makes APS um, special in this case. Uh, a similar facility, ALS at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab um, has also very high brightness, um, but at lower photon energies. Um, so the next talk next week, David Macaluso from the University of Montana is gonna talk about his research using um, the ALS light source at, at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Um, so that should be really interesting. Hope everybody can make it. All right, so these x-rays travel around and around and they go through these um, deflections and they're emitting x-rays. And so when they're emitting x-rays, they're actually losing energy. So how do they keep this facility um, operating for you know, up to half a day or something um, with a, really the same batch of electrons? They do that by introducing these RF cavities. So there's um, a lot of these around the uh, circuit of the um, vacuum tube. So this part in the photograph, um, the part on the left, you can see the vacuum tube going through the middle of these RF cavities. Um, they also call them RF buckets, I think. But what goes on here is there's an oscillating um, electromagnetic field inside these cavities. And so that is time to resonate um, with the frequency of the electrons um, circuiting this large storage ring. And if some of the electrons happen to be, um, uh, have a frequency that's uh, the same as the frequency of this oscillation, which is on the megahertz range, then they will be accelerated in this field. Um, from what I understand, this is also a way of shaping the beam and keeping it compact. So some of these electrons might start losing energy. Some of them might start going a little slower than others. Um, and so you don't want them to spread out and lose this sort of like pulse nature of the electron packet. So they use these RF cavities to weed out the really slow ones or the really fast ones and um, keep this 
little electron packet shaped sort of like a, a squish cigar. Um, I think APS typically operates with 24 packets of electrons in the, in the um, large storage ring at a time. Although I, um, I believe they said they could operate it with a maximum of 1,296 bunches. Um, but for most of the science that's done there, I think they prefer to operate it in this 24 bunch mode. All right, um, I'm gonna skip this slide, um, but this is just talking a little bit about the electron pulses. Um, okay, one quick thing before I stop. Um, I did add some of these extra slides in case anyone has any questions about um, the difference between the way the two neutron sources work. Um, what these slides show is um, the difference between the measurements. So we use a time of flight type measurement um, at, the, at the spallation neutron source. We can time the neutrons leaving the moderator and hitting the sample and then hitting the detector and then use that to extract useful information about their scattering momentum transfer. Whereas at a continuous source, we use something more like, um, you know, what we're used to, where we have sort of this monochromator, we extract a certain wavelength that hits our sample um, and scatters, and then we measure that scattering event at a detector. So you can look at those um, later if you have questions, I can talk about them a little bit more. But I wanted to make sure I hit this before I quit. Um, 3 p.m. next Wednesday, Everyone who's listening should plan on attending this. Um, I do want you to know there's one caveat. We're, I'm going to cut off the time um, at about 50 or 55 minutes because our research office public lecture series um, starts right at 4 o'clock right after that. And that talk, I believe, is going to be uh, a former director of the National Science Foundation. Um, and that's going to be uh, a really good lecture. And I want everyone to be able to attend that. If you want to know how to attend, go to the Montana Tech Research Office website. I think they have information on there. Um, so Dr. Macaluso is going to talk about his work in looking at um, planetary nebulae and um, galactic uh, nuclei, which I know nothing about, but I'm super excited about learning. Also, um, you know, Alex sitting here with me was saying he might be interested in, in, in um, neutron or X-ray scattering and learning more, so I'm going to highly recommend these two references. The Neutron Scattering Primer, written by Roger Pinn, um, uh, is very, very easy to read. He presents all of this information um, in a way that even beginners can understand, so I, you know, maybe start with that. And then if you want to learn more about X-ray and neutron scattering and the mathematical fundamentals, uh, I would then hit Sivia's book um, on elementary scattering theory.